Good morning. <laughs> it's wonderful to see everyone. It's just such a huge number. <laughs> Thank you for coming to pray today. On our program, I think at this point we have the retreat talk. And as we already have seen, the retreat speaker will be Sister Anne Estelle. I just want to say a few words of introduction and welcome to her. When I sent an email to Sister Anne about four weeks ago or five weeks ago at the most, maybe even less, I asked her if she could and would be willing to speak at our Lenten Day of Recollection today. My reasoning was that taking advantage of the beauty of our late 19th century beautiful Gothic church, rich in art and architecture, how might this richness lead us to a contemplation of God and the desire for holiness? And so Sister Anne writes back just less than 24 hours after and I read her very words. Dear Father Ken, this is a beautiful retreat topic and I am drawn to it. Thank you for thinking of me. I am worried though that I won't have the time needed to prepare sufficiently well since I am not at all familiar with your parish church, its artwork and architecture. I'm not sure I've ever been there before. Would you have time to meet with me there someday soon to introduce me to the sacred space and to share with me your vision for the retreat more concretely? These words filled my heart with joy because I took them to mean, yes, I will do it. <laughs> and so I wrote back to Sister Anne and we set a date to meet and we did meet here. And I think she's been back to this church maybe two, two times more after that to pray and to kind of get into the space where she would be speaking about. It is my pleasure, therefore, to thank Sister Anne and on our behalf to welcome her to St. Joe Parish. By the way, there is one little fun thing. She thought she hadn't been here before, but then when she eventually got here the day we were to meet, she realized, oh, I think I'd been here once for baptism or something, but I missed my way the day I was coming. <laughs> and so maybe I didn't remember anymore that I had been here before. So welcome back, Sister Anne. Just a brief introduction of who she is. Sister Anne is a professor in the Department of Theology at the University of Notre Dame, and she belongs to the Schoenstatt Sisters of Mary. She is an expert in the topic she will be um, sharing with us. And just a little about some of the things that she has done. In 2006, she wrote a book titled Eating Beauty, the Eucharist and the Spir Spiritual Arts of the Middle Ages. Among many other works that she has done, I'm just listing a few. And more recently, in 2020, she wrote an article which she titled Saving Fear in Christian Spirituality. And in the same year, she also wrote another article titled Mysticism of Social Life. And she's completing a monograph on the hagiography and the Bible, so saints, study of saints and the Bible. She's been the recipient of the NEH Fellowship and John Simon Gottenheim Memorial Fellowship. And she is a past president of the Society for the Study of Christian Spirituality and also of the Colloquium of Violence and Religion. But above all, Sister Anne is a holy woman. She is a key player in the continued intellectual and spiritual enrichment of our Department of Theology at the University of Notre Dame. And for this, she is very much loved and respected by both her colleagues and by us, her students. Please join me, welcome Sister Anne today.
Earlier this week, we read from the book of Sirach, and it says, praise no one before he speaks. <laughs> so I thought I would, I, I was worried that Father Ken might say something nice. <laughs> Okay. Sin causes war and violence. Sin destroys the beauty of the world. These thoughts were much with me in September 2001 when I was in Washington, D.C. on 9-11, just starting the sabbatical year in which I would write most of the book eating beauty. Today, 20 years later, we are witnessing Russia's ruthless, brutal invasion of Ukraine. Once beautiful buildings are reduced to rubble, human bodies are left unrecognizable. At the same time, the world is being moved to tears and to action by the beauty of brave men and women who love their country, a president who refuses to leave his people under assault, unarmed individuals who walk in front of tanks to stop their progress, Russian anti-war protesters who risk and suffer arrest. Beauty and destruction, images opposed and yet strangely inseparable, only Catholic Christianity, not Platonic philosophy, not Stoicism, only Catholic Christianity has both an account of artistic beauty strong enough to include depictions of suffering and a narrative of salvation history strong enough to include real and terrible suffering. Against the background of current events, this Lent is unlike any other in our lifetime. We want to make good use of it. We want to be transformed by it. This wanting is our desire for holiness. Lent is often described as a journey through the desert recalling the 40 years of the wandering of the Israelites, but also the 40 days through which, during which Jesus fasted in the wilderness after his baptism in the Jordan. Lent is also associated with the way of the cross. These images of a desert journey and a sorrowful way accord well with our sense of Lent as a season for asceticism, self-denial. Our topic for today, sacred art and the desire for holiness, a topic for which we must thank Father Ken, suggests another way, the way of beauty, the via pulchritudinis. As we shall see, the way of beauty is also necessarily an ascetic past, but it, reduce, it resists any reduction to mere self-discipline. The way of beauty, a sacramental and artistic path that transfigures ordinary reality, strengthens our sacrificial spirit by orienting it steadfastly and receptively to the object of our love. Father Joseph Kantenich, the founder of the Schoenstatt movement, calls this way of beauty a Marian route, a prophetic attachment to the persons, places, tasks, and things that function for us as sacramental signs and symbols. Like Moses' sister Miriam, singing God's praise, playing her timbrel, and dancing at the shore of the Red Sea. Our Mother Mary, our Miriam, shows us the way of beauty that ends in our praise at the Easter Vigil. Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. Horse and rider, 
he is thrown into the sea. The reference to Miriam's poetic praise, her music, which led the people of Israel in worship, provides us with an entry point. What do we mean by sacred art? To answer that question, in the first part of my talk, we turn first to Holy Scripture and then to the philosophers. In the second part, I point to a number of examples of people who have found in sacred art a means to grow in holiness. Finally, I want to meditate with you on works of sacred art in this beautiful church of St. Joseph. Part one, what is sacred art? Holy Scripture gives us three founding narratives for sacred art. In the first, in Exodus, Moses receives a commission to erect the sanctuary. In this erection, various art forms come to the fore. First, God shows Moses in a vision on the mountain the design for the temp tent of meeting. In this visionary role, Moses exemplifies the vocation of the church architect and his artwork, sacred architecture. Second, Moses orders a collection of contributions from the community, gold, silver, jewelry, precious stones, woven cloths, acacia wood, oils, and skins. Then, these collected materials, all of them already shaped by human work and creativity, are entrusted to brilliant artisans whom the Lord calls by name, Bezalel of the tribe of Judah and Aholab, Aholab of the tribe of Dan. Of Bezalel, the Lord says, quote, I filled him with the Spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship, to devise artistic designs, to work in gold, silver, and bronze, in cutting stones for settings, in carving wood, for work in every craft, unquote. Exodus 31, 3. Fourth, Aaron and his sons are dedicated as priests to maintain the sanctuary and artisans prepare the vestments they are to wear, all according to the design given to Moses. Finally, the Lord himself completes and perfects the sanctuary, filling it with a cloud of God's presence. With the presence of the Holy One in their midst, the desire of the people for holiness is in part fulfilled but they themselves must also be and become holy, as God is holy, by keeping his commandments. The artwork of the sanctuary is an expression of the calling of Israel to holiness, but also a means for them to fulfill it. Thus you are to be holy to me, for I the Lord am holy, and I have set you apart from the peoples to be mine, Leviticus 20, 26. Moses, as one drawn from the water and is leading the people out of slavery in Egypt, envisions the construction and maintenance of the sanctuary as a means of education and ongoing spiritual formation for the people. The sanctuary gives the people a uniting center. The rituals he prescribes for the priests and Levites to perform on behalf of the people are enactments of a prophetic drama of salvation that simultaneously recalls a salvific history, the theophanies experienced by Moses, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and the Israelites themselves. The ark houses a stone upon which the finger of the living God has written the commandments. It contains also the manna, the bread from heaven, through which God has sustained his people in the wilderness. Played out in the cycle of feasts and prescribed rituals, this liturgical drama is itself 
a sacred art. In a second founding narrative, which builds upon the first, King David envisions and commissions the building of the temple by his son, Solomon. In 1 Corinthians 28, we read, quote, David gave to his son Solomon the design of the portico and of the house itself, with its storerooms, its upper rooms and inner chambers, the shrine containing the cover of the ark. He provided also the design for all else that he had in mind by way of courts for the house of the Lord, the surrounding compartments for the treasuries of the Lord, and the, and the treasuries for votive offerings as well as for the divisions of the priests and Levites, for all the work of the service of the house of God, for all the liturgical vessels of the house of the Lord." Unquote. 1 Chronicles 28. Even as, as Moses took up a collection for the erection of the sanctuary, David takes the lead in giving and calling for donations. Quote, gold for what will be made of gold, silver for what will be made of silver, bronze for what will be made of bronze, iron for what will be made of iron, wood for what will be made of wood, onyx stones and settings for them, carnelian and mosaic stones, every kind of precious stone, great quantities of marble, everything needed for every work to be done by artisans." Unquote. David also assembles the musicians for the Lord's service. Certain sons of Asaph and Heman and Jeduthun who shall prophesy with lyre and harps and cymbals, their prophecies taking the poetic form of psalms. In a third founding narrative, the visionary designs for the sanctuary and the temple are revealed to be foreshadowings of the heavenly place of worship, the New Jerusalem. The visionary of Patmos describes the bejeweled city with its 12 gates, concluding with the words, quote, and I saw no temple in the city, for the temple is the Lord God the Almighty and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of the Lord is its light. Revelations 21. The sacred art of Israel's sanctuary, the temple, and the anticipated New Jerusalem has, of course, influence the sacred art of Christian churches. Most obviously, perhaps, the sanctuary area contains the Eucharistic tabernacle, our Ark of the Covenant, our mercy seat, which is often guarded, guarded as it is here by sculpted angels, one on each side, recalling the cherubim of glory on the sides of the mercy seat in the sanctuary. The meaning of the mercy seat is made visible to us through the central crucifix, which recalls the crucifixion of Christ, the Lord of glory, through whom we have received God's mercy. In the sanctuary, too, the altar, the place of meal and sacrifice, and the pulpit or lectern from which the living God, the living word of God, is proclaimed. In the beautiful pulpit here in St. Joseph's Church, the four evangelists are depicted together with their symbols, which recall the four living creatures in the, in the book of Apocalypse, the lion, the ox, the man, the, evil, the eagle. The vaulted ceilings of Christian churches and their high altars literally uplift our eyes and hearts to heavenly things. The number and proportions of the arches in the polygonal apse not infrequently recall the interplay of seven and eight, the days of Sabbath and resurrection, the perfection of God's work, the resting at a peak in counterpose, the meeting of time and eternity. We see exactly this interplay of seven and eight in the ceiling of the sanctuary here. Count the arches. Like the Israelites of old, we too make our offerings. We use sacred vessels. We keep the sanctuary lamp lit. We burn the incense of adoration in golden censers. 
meditating on the biblical founding narratives of sacred art, St. Bonaventure, in the soul's journey into God, associates the three parts of the sanctuary with three stages in the soul's ascent. Quote, we can contemplate God not only outside us and within us, but also above us. Those who have become practiced in the first way have already entered the court before the tabernacle. Those practiced in the second way have entered the sanctuary. And those practiced in the third way enter with the high priest into the holy of holies. The medieval English mystic who authored The Cloud of Unknowing also draws a connection between sacred art and the desire for holiness. He interprets the Ark of the Covenant as a soul. And the three figures we've already met this morning, uh, Moses, Bezalel, and Aaron, as symbols for three different ways of experiencing the grace of contemplation. The active, the mixed, and the contemplative ways. Moses, who has a great desire for holiness, must climb the mountain and exert great effort before he receives an extraordinary ecstatic vision which comes to him solely as an inbreak of grace and not as a reward for all his toil. Moses represents the active way. Bezalel experiences the grace of contemplation as a result of his own skill, supported by the work of grace. He is, uh, he is unable to see the ark before he has made it by his own efforts, guided by the pattern shown to Moses on the mountain. His is the mixed way, a combination of action and contemplation. Aaron, in this scheme of things, represents the pure contemplative, for whom con contemplation is a constant way of life. According to the author of The Cloud of Unknowing, there are some who by grace are so sensitive spiritually and so at home with God in this grace of contemplation that they may have it when they like and under normal spiritual working conditions. Unquote. Much could be said about these interpretations, but for now let us think of them as a fertile reminder that sacred art has a spiritual significance, not only for the church in Via, as she makes her pilgrim journey toward God, but also for the individual members of the church who, desirous of holiness, worship together with others in a sacred space filled with objects of beauty. Consecrated to God's service, these objects, statues, windows, floor designs, arches, murals, icons, vestments, lamps, they all provide a way for the whole world to be itself a new creation, dedicated anew to its maker, they speak a language that is prophetic, that trains us to see the world in a sacramental way. The monstrance used to expose the blessed sacrament to our sight, our adoration, regularly encircles the host to extend its radiance. By the divine transubstantiation of bread and wine, the greatest of the sacred artworks the Eucharist itself, has a cosmic effect. This mystery is, of course, most immediately tangible in the spiritual effect it has on us and our lives. In the Eucharist, we eat the beauty that has the power to make us beautiful too, the very artwork of God. Define narrowly 
Sacred art is art intended for, worship, for use in worship of the church. Not art, not, e not even art on religious topics, designed for exhibition in art museums or performance in theaters or concert halls or for other non-liturgical uses. In his History of Philosophy, Hegel emphasizes this distinction between sacred art and fine art, treating the art of piety as barely worthy of the name art. Good old Hegel. <laughs> he says, um, images were known of old. Piety at an early time required them for worship, but it could do without beautiful images. These might even be disturbing. But in every beautiful painting, there's also something non-spiritual, merely external, but its spirit speaks to man through its beauty. Worshiping, conversely, is concerned with the work as, a, as an object, for it is but a spiritless stupor of the soul. <laughs> I'm quoting Hegel. <laughs> Fine art has arisen in the church Although it has barely gone, it's already, if, it, if it's fine art, it's already gone beyond its principle as sacred art. Unquote. In his history of, the, of fine art, Hegel spells out a variation on this claim that shifts its perspective from the intent of the artist to the reception of the beholder. Quote, we've gone beyond the stage of reverence for works of art as divine and objects deserving our worship. The impression the works of fine art produce is one of a more reflective kind, and the emotions they arouse require a higher test." Unquote. As Walter Benjamin has pointed out, Hegel's distinctions are problematic in many ways. A certain oscillation between these two poles of reception, um, the, the worshipful one and the one of, that's aesthetic, can be demonstrated for each work of art. Raphael's Madonna, known to us as the Sistine Madonna, was first commissioned by Pope Julius II, who intended it for his own tomb, but who had it first placed on the high altar of the Church of the Black Friars, San Sisto, at Piacenza. In its subsequent history, Raphael's masterpiece has been housed in museums in Moscow and Dresden. It was in Dresden during World War II. The work of many of the great religious artists is known to viewers today only in museum context, removed from the liturgical context in which they were originally intended to be used as altar pieces. The presence of the masterworks that remain in churches tends to transform the churches also into museums. I remember my shock when I went to the cathedral in Antwerp to pray and was required to pay a fee at a turnstile because the cathedral happens to hold four magnificent altarpieces by Peter Paul Rubens. Even in a church, sacred art, art intended for worship, can be received simply as fine art without awakening in the viewer any conscious design for holiness. There's also the danger that Hegel may be proved right about the object character of sacred art when it's used even by the faithful thoughtlessly or wrongly and thus fails to fulfill its proper sacred function. On the one hand, a picture of grace may be disparaged because it supposedly lacks any aesthetic quality. On the other hand, a work of fine religious art may, by its heightened beauty, prove distractive or even idolatrous. These errors at opposite ends of a spectrum of possible responses to religious art, both can be corrected by increased attention. Let me illustrate with two somewhat opposite cases. The picture of grace now venerated in the Schoenstatt movement enshrines worldwide, 
was donated to the young members of a fledgling Marian sodality at the Palatine's Minor Seminary in Schoenstatt, Germany in 1915. A priest on the faculty had found a copy of Luigi Crozio's painting of Mary as Refuge of Sinners in a pawn shop. It was not to the taste of the boys who would have preferred a more Germanic Madonna. They thought the painting was a little sentimental, was kitsch. But they accepted it, retitled it in honor of the Mother Thrice Admirable, and developed a whole spirituality centered on this particular picture of Mary holding her, her son Jesus. By giving it attention, meditating on it, the boys came to find the picture speaking to their hearts and changing them into reflections of Mary. I consecrate to you this day my eyes, my ears, my mouth, my heart, my entire self without reserve. Within the visual piety of Schoenstatt, this particular picture, initially ill-favored by the founding generation, has become the means and expression worldwide of a lived covenant of love with Mary. Illustrating the opposite end of the spectrum, St. Augustine, that great lover of music, struggled against the temptation to be so caught up in the musical beauty of psalmody that he failed to pray the words he sang or heard another sing. Chant was sometimes an end in itself for him, not something that lifted his heart to God. Rather than forbidding chant in the churches of his diocese, however, Augustine permitted it and following the example of his mentor Ambrose, promoted it. Pitting a heightened attention against the danger of distraction, Augustine meditated on the Psalms, verse by verse, and preached on each of the Psalms over the course of three decades. For Augustine, the very strings of the psaltery and lyre, the strings by which beautiful music in God's praise is made, symbolize and motivate our dying to self, our mortification, the bodily disciplines of fasting, chastity, self-control. This brings us to part two. Can there be an asceticism of attention to sacred art? Asceticism is a big key word for Lent and aesthetics is a key word for artistic experience. Both asceticism and aesthetics involve the physical senses, sensory perception, but in contrastive ways. In the discipline of ascetical practice, a discipline we joyfully take up at the start of Lent, we limit our sensory intake. We renounce bodily pleasures we close the gates of our senses. In the experience of art, by contrast, we open the senses to take in impressions, to drink in the beauty we see, hear, taste, touch, smell. In a famous exchange with Suget, the abbot of Saint-Denis, Saint Bernard of Clairvaux argued against the appropriateness for Cistercian monks of lush religious imagery and stained glass windows. Theirs was to be a plainer path, a meditative artwork nourished only by the biblical word and preparing for imageless contemplation. We're not Cistercian monks, but, for Lent, but Lent for us is also about fasting and abstaining by giving up food in quantity and quality. We limit our hearing and speaking by not saying or singing the A word during Lent in the liturgies. Bell ringing is subdued, ultimately replaced perhaps by a clapper. In some parishes, the holy water basins are empty during Lent, affecting the sense of touch. 
During Passion Week, the statues in the church are veiled. During the Triduum, candles are extinguished, the altar stripped, all renunciations involving sight. The purification of our senses then gives us a new experience of seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, and smelling at Easter when we come into new life, a share in Christ's resurrected life. The statues are unveiled, the bells ring, the sanctuary is filled with arrayed flowers, the church smells like lilies, light pours through the stained glass. The different sacred art forms, music, painting, sculpture, architecture, are so beautiful that they remind us of a paradise regained, a paradise all the more beautiful because of the previous silencing of the senses. A kind of love-filled asceticism and a certain kind of religious aesthetics properly belong to each other, like two sides of a single coin. Like the Paschal mystery itself, which inseparably joins Christ dying and rising, our Lenten journey aims from the beginning at Easter. And the risen Lord, with his saving grace, his transfiguring presence, is with us, supporting us at every step of the journey. Christ's own suffering and death has, in fact, revolutionized the very idea of the beautiful in the Christian imagination, to make it include what is at face value ugly. In his snow-white radiance on Mount Tabor, Jesus discussed with Moses and Elijah his coming passion. Christ painted his own face in blood on Veronica's veil. A focused attention upon a single work of religious art can purify the senses. Such an exercise of attention entails a kind of asceticism, a renunciation and forgetfulness of self before the beauty of the object, a passive receptivity which then allows the artwork to carry a person beyond itself. Sacred art is never art for art's sake, but art that serves another end, art that is useful for us in our worship, our religious formation and reformation. Religious art is intended to uplift us, to raise us above itself, to awaken our desire for holiness, to enable our more intimate contact with God and the saints. Thus understood, the finest of sacred art is artisanal. When we use religious art as a tool, a technology of the faith, we work on ourselves, or rather, God, the master artist, works on us. Cutting out what is excess, straight, straightening what has been bent, tuning what is out of tune, brightening a color that has been clouded over with dust or smoke. The artistic process as a way of beauty aims at the finished artwork, the masterpiece, but it is impossible without a sacrificial asceticism and a certain vision of an ideal. In a vision, St. Rose of Lima saw herself together with other young virgins in a sculptor's studio, weeping as they cut away at the statues they were carving. Michelangelo lying on his back on a high scaffold for days and weeks and months labored to paint the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Mary, mother of God, patiently wove for her son Jesus the robe without seams, the precious, seamless garment stripped from him at Calvary. The crucified Son of God, the Lord of glory, the crucified image of the Father, underwent all that he suffered, used the very tools of his tormentors that we might be refashioned in the image according to the likeness of God. In the windows at the back of the sanctuary here, 
we see the angels holding these very tools, the blindfold, the scourging pillar, the whip, the cross, the nails, but also the Veronica, it's on this side, the veil with which Christ left his bloody imprint of his holy face. A popular late medieval devotional poem, it's always illustrated in the manuscripts, proposes these instruments of the passion, one by one, as a way to examine one's own conscience, work on oneself. Once I gave my younger sister Faith the task to illustrate a set of 14 sonnets I had written about the joys and sorrows of the Virgin Mary. At the time, my sister confesses in the preface to our book, she was a student of fine art, but not a religious person. She did not attend church. She did not pray. But the very act of meditating on the poems and drawing the illustrations one by one, line by line, effected a change in my sister. Creating the drawings marked the first steps of her return to the Catholic faith. The Irish sculptor, painter, and mosaic artist, Donnie McManus, who has dedicated his life to religious art, tells about how he went to St. Peter's in Rome shortly after hearing in succession about the suicide of two young friends. As a remedy for his grief, he sat for days in front of Michelangelo's Pietà, drawing line by line the form of Christ's lifeless body outstretched on his mother's lap. The fact of the Incarnation, which gave the Son of God the ability to die for us, has revealed the beauty and dignity of the human form, a revelation to which the artist must witness, McManus believes, by his very vocation as artist. Henri Nouwen, a famous retreat master tells of his graced encounter with an artwork, Rembrandt's painting of the return of the prodigal son. Someone put a poster of that painting on his office door. No one was fascinated by it. The more he studied it, thought about it, the more he discovered his whole life story in that painting. Not content with seeing a poster of the famous painting, he traveled to Russia, to St. Petersburg, where the original is housed in the Hermitage Museum. Now and sat there for hours, for days, drinking in the details of the painting and what it meant for him personally. He identified himself first with the prodigal, then with the brother of the prodigal, then with the depicted Pharisees, finally with the father. Meditating on the painting helped Nowen in his own process of repenting, of reconciliation with his father, of home going. Nowen thought and imagined with the painting. The artwork came alive, as it were, for him. It was instrumental in changing him. Nowen also used his written meditations to help others to guide them in their own Lenten retreats. We might ask ourselves today, has any particular artwork ever moved me in the way that Rembrandt's Return of the Prodigal Son affected Nowen? One semester, I was a visiting professor at Loyola University in Chicago. I taught a course on beauty in the Eucharist. For their final paper assignment, each student chose a Eucharistic artwork to discuss in theological terms. A poem, a painting, a sculpture, a musical composition, a monstrance, a tabernacle, 
even the transient flower mosaics made annually for our Corpus Christi processional. One young lady wrote about her grandfather's carving of the Last Supper, a relief carving enshrined in the family's own dining room. The same grandfather hand-carved crucifixes for each of his children for their first communion. As she meditated on the love-filled meaning of these carvings, she discovered in greater depth how she herself had been formed in the faith in the domestic church of her home through her grandfather's artwork on Lenten and Eucharistic themes. I ask us to think what religious art was in our home, your home, as a child. What religious art is in your home today? What use do you make of it? As St. Edith Stein instructs us, St. John of the Cross encountered religious artwork as a child. In particular, his home parish, in Fonteveros, had a crucifix that showed the Savior's face disfigured in pain. The artwork used real human hair so that Jesus' hair hung down from his cheeks to his scourged shoulders. John's natural childlike openness to sensory impressions and wonderment at the world around him, combined with what Stein calls a holy realism, a confident acceptance of the reality of the mysteries of the faith. In this case, of Jesus Christ, who was crucified under Pontius Pilate, suffered, died, and was buried. In John's case, a third factor came into play, the boy's own artistic nature, which urged him to give expression to what he thought and felt, not only in poetry, but also in visual art, drawings, carvings. Finally, and most importantly, John's interior focus on Christ crucified and the exterior artistic expressions he gave to that great love of his called him again and again to follow Christ in his everyday life. The beauty he formed as an artist, the many crosses he drew and carved, the poetry he wrote also called to him to fulfill his vocation as John of the Cross. One of St. John's drawings has famously inspired the work of another artist, Salvador Dali's Christ of St. John of the Cross. How many times do we encounter a crucifix? Is there any symbolic expression frequently used in the liturgy found perhaps in every church, that calls to you in a particular personal way as a cross call to St. John. Pope Francis has chosen as his papal motto a phrase from Bede the Venerable's commentary on the calling of St. Matthew. At the age of 17, the young Jorge Bergoglio went to confession on the feast of St. Matthew and received the grace of his own conversion and calling. For many years now, starting long before his election as Pope, he has gone regularly to the Church of St. Louis of the French to spend time looking at Caravaggio's painting of three events in the Apostle's life, starting with the calling of St. Matthew. In it, he sees expressed the mystery of his own calling his own having been called in God's mercy to follow Christ. Ask yourself, is there a certain scene in the gospel that you like to see depicted, that you like to imagine, to meditate on? Some works of sacred art allow us literally to participate in the vision of a saint. I think here not only of artworks like Fra Angelico's Mystic Wheel, which is a vision of Ezekiel, or John Brogel's vision of St. Hubertus, 
or of Alonso Cano's vision of St. Bernard, works intended for use in churches, but also of those extraordinary artworks, pictures of grace that result directly from the vision of a saint. The tilma of Juan Diego allows us to see Our Lady of Guadalupe as she showed herself to him. Similarly, the Divine Mercy painting commissioned by St. Faustina at the Lord's command presents us with at least an approximation of the Lord as he appeared to her. Such artworks, which make no claim to be fine art, now appear in churches that claim them not only as works of religious art, but as relics. Reading the words on the picture of the Divine Mercy, Jesus, I trust in you, repeating them, can affect a conversion in the soul, instilling an invincible childlike confidence in Christ, and opening the soul to the flood of graces, baptismal and Eucharistic, flowing from the pierced heart of Jesus. Here at St. Joseph's, I've seen people kneeling before the Divine Mercy picture. sharing in St. Faustina's vision. When we think of the saints, we may envy them their ability to be moved so deeply by the content of our faith, moved emotionally and into action on behalf of others. The content of the faith can become, as it were, too familiar to us, too taken for granted. At the same time, we take in so many impressions from the sea of media that surrounds us that we have difficulty savoring any single impression. The awareness of our own emotional numbness pains us. How grateful we are when we can feel that something has actually touched us, moved us from within, made us cry. In Stein's words, we rejoice when we can convince ourselves through experience that we're still able to feel deep, genuine joy. And deep, genuine pain also seems to us a grace when compared to our rigid insensitivity, our numbness of feeling. Perhaps for this reason, the philosopher Simon Weil attached such salvific importance to the experience of beauty in the cosmos, a transcendent beauty expressed in great works of art among them, she likes to name Gregorian chant, the paintings of Giotto, and the poetry of George Herbert. Present during Holy Week at the Benedictine Monastery at Solem in 1938, they focused her mind on the beauty of the chant as a way of rising above the pain of her migraine headache, of transcending herself. This exercise of focusing on something beautiful, on an artwork beautiful in itself, and therefore revelatory of the beauty of the divine order, proved an avenue of grace for Ve. For her, the love of the things of ritual practice, the things to which we are often first exposed as children, before we have the capacity to understand their significance, is already an implicit form of the love of God because their whole purpose is to bring us into contact with what is perfectly pure. They are not themselves perfectly pure, but they touch upon something perfectly pure, a transcendent beauty. Religious things are pure by right, theoretically, hypothetically, by convention, she observes. Therefore, their beauty is unconditional. It doesn't depend on their possession of a certain aesthetic quality. The church may be ugly, the singing out of tune, the priests corrupt, and the faithful inattentive. In a sense, she writes, that's of no importance. The convention by which religious things are pure 
is ratified by God himself, an effective convention, a convention containing virtue and operating of itself. When Ve uses the language of convention, convencio in Latin, she brings together the ascetic tradition of what is fitting with a contractual notion of an agreement and the communal sense of an assembly. In a sacramental order, outward signs fit to the hidden grace that operates in them and through them in accord with the covenant Christ is sealed with Christ's church. Only in the case of the Eucharist are the outward signs of the sacraments, of the sacrament, mere appearances, lacking substance in themselves. They are, in Vey's terms, a convention, nothing else. And therefore, a fitting point of contact and communion with Christ, who has emptied himself for us in the Eucharist, that he may be consumed by us. All the sacred artworks of the liturgy, architecture, singing, language, even if the words chosen by, are chosen by Christ himself, center for Ve on the Eucharist. According to Ve, every loving contact with what is pure, what is beautiful, effectively destroys what is evil in us. The substance of the one, the true, the beautiful, the good, casting out what is insubstantial, dispelling the evil that is the lack of the good. For this reason, she advocated a turning away from the evil we seek to overcome in ourselves through willful exertion, and a receptive turning instead toward the light of the good. Although not a baptized Catholic, she knelt in rapt adoration before the Eucharist, soaking up its rays, exposing herself to its light, practicing a spiritual communion with the Christ who had come to her. Man can only fix his full attention on something tangible, and therefore he needs something to fix his attention upon perfect purity. This counsel of Simon Weil is doubtless useful for us if we want to pursue a way of beauty through the desert of this Lent. When the devil tempts Jesus in the wilderness, he places before the Lord the proposal to turn a stone into bread and thus to satisfy his hunger. Jesus does not allow himself to become fascinated with the stone nor does he announce a muscular asceticism that enables him to go without eating. Instead, he fixes his eye, ear, the mouth of his soul on another source of nourishment, every word that comes from the mouth of God. Part 3 sacred art in our Lenten journey here at St. Joseph's. Father Ken has the idea, the intuition, that God wants us to follow a way of beauty, a via pulchritudinous during this Lent. Why does he think that? Perhaps it's because this parish, the Church of St. Joseph in Mishawaka, has rich resources of religious art. The works of sacred art found here may well provide us with inspiration for our personal journey this Lent. When one enters this church, one immediately enters into a special atmosphere where we breathe, see, and hear differently. As a relative stranger to this church, one of my first impressions was this church building teaches what it means to be church, to live in communion with God and God's saints. The stained glass windows, the paintings, the relief carvings, they all bring us sensibly into the company of holy members of the family of God. Architectural forms, the, the little churches inside this church, frame the different persons and mysteries. I love this little, little guardian angel in the, um, 
The confessional, too, is a little church. One can easily draw the conclusion that each of us is a little church, a dwelling place of the Holy Trinity. Being inside this church helps a person to be cognizant of one's own interiority, one's own mystery. My second impression is that the two large stained glass windows provide much food for the soul for Lenten reflection. The Holy Family window is but one of several depictions of St. Joseph in this church, each pointing to a different aspect of this great saint, your parish's patron saint and patron for the universal church. On the back wall of the sanctuary, St. Joseph, together with his young adoptive son, Jesus, stands facing the crucifix from behind, seeing and foreseeing it. The figure of St. Joseph is right beneath that of the Heavenly Father. Together, the earthly and the Heavenly Father offer their son. The human love of Joseph, making the loving of God the Father more tangible. On the side wall of the asp, a picture of the dying St. Joseph with Mary and Jesus at his bedside mirrors the triangle of figures at the central crucifixion scene. With the dying Joseph placed in the middle as an altar Christus, and Christ, his son, Jesus, standing where the Apostle John will later stand. Woman, behold your son. The mural of the espousals of Joseph and Mary on the opposite wall can be paired with the Annunciation window, where Mary speaks her fiat, but also the facing window that shows St. Joseph with the child Jesus. Like the angel who instructs Mary about her maternal vocation, Christ himself teaches his adoptive father who listen, about his, his paternal vocation, who listens to him. Joseph listens to him with his hand placed over his heart. The large Holy Family window shows a seated Mary spinning the carpenter Joseph at his woodwork, and the boy Jesus with wood planks on his shoulder. The boy presents them to Joseph, who reaches out his hand to take them from him, to lighten his burden. The artist of the window has made the planks on Jesus' shoulder appear cruciform to the uh, clever uh, device of the coloring of the edge of the step, which intersects with the lines of the plank. We as viewers clearly see a cross foreshadowing Jesus' predestined crucifixion. From within the scene, however, it would appear differently, and yet Mary and Joseph seem to see what we see. Mary turns a serious, pensive gaze upon her child. Joseph looks toward Mary as if to draw her attention to what Jesus is doing, even as he reaches to accept the child's offering. Joseph resembles Abraham, who takes the wood from the burnt offering from his son Isaac. But his face, turned toward Mary, triangulates the scene and involves her in the interaction. All three figures Mary, Joseph, Jesus are doing their work, cooperating in the work of redemption. A whole spirituality of work, suffering, and love may be symbolized in this scene. As sacred art, the window also works on us, helping us, too, to do our part The large stained glass window from the uh, opposite, the Holy Family window, depicts the Last Supper scene 
as the first Holy Communion of the Apostles, some of whom kneel in reverent adoration before the chalice that a standing Jesus holds in his hands. The serious, frightened, unsure faces of the other apostles register their response to the question that Jesus seems to be silently asking them, are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? At the side, Judas can be seen going out the door. Also at the side, loaves of bread and a vessel of water or wine rest upon a table with a bowl for the feet washing on the floor. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? This is a question the Lord is asking us this Lent, but also at every Holy Communion. Every Holy Communion seals our discipleship. To receive the sacrament worthily, one wants to be able to say yes. But the memory of the fear, flight, and denial of the apostles moves a person to add, but only through your grace, Lord. Having come through two full years of pandemic and facing now the real possibility of world war, sacred art, like the art found in this church, but also in the great treasury of Holy Mother Church, helps us calmly and bravely to continue the work on ourselves that, through Christ's grace, will cause our own lives to be mirrored in the artwork we see, to re-echo with the hymns we sing. Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. Horse and rider, he has thrown into the sea. Thank you. Thank you, sister. <laughs> that was awesome. I think we will immediately move now to the um, cafeteria. It will be more productive for us to fuse both our Q&A and our group discussions together at the cafeteria. So if we can just as briskly as possible move to the cafeteria because we will return here at 12.15 to conclude with benediction and midday prayer. Thank you. <laughs>